chapter 2, verse 1 through 21 of Acts. This one is on the Holy Spirit, comes at Pentecost, which is actually when the church began to thrive, birthed into the area, and they were experiencing the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, in the blessed name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for this series. We thank you because we know this word is going to mean so much to so many people. Uh, it's going to provide the knowledge and the wisdom that we need, the exercise through the word of God, to apply it to our lives, that it begins changing us, to eventually being spread to the community, hopefully the city, the state, and then who knows, even the world is not too small to you. So we praise you, God. Holy Ghost, take charge of this message. Give the people of God the revelation, the impartation, and the illumination of God's Word and their understanding today that God's people would never, ever be the same again in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen and a glorious hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. And the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. Now I want you to understand right now before I go to verse, the next verse, there was 120 in this upper room. They said what seemed to be tongues of fire fell on each one of them, and they began to speak in tongues. It landed on all of them, not 119. It didn't land on 75. It didn't land on 40 or 50. It landed on every single one of them, all 120 in the upper room, and all of them began to speak in different languages that were not their own. That's why I tell people the gifts of the Spirit are for everybody. And the gift of tongues, many even in the community we live in today, believe that that one along with the prophecy and some others went out when the apostles went to heaven. That is a lie. That is naive. Naivete, it's... The Bible says they're not the gifts of the apostles. They're the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he gives them as he determines, as he sees fit. But if you want it, he'll give it to you. If you're afraid of it, he won't. If you don't want it, he won't give it to you. You got to want it. You got to expect it. You got to want to have it, want to receive it. And he'll give it to you. It's not the spirit of salvation and regeneration. That's different. This is a spirit endued with power, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem some God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in their own native language. Utterly amazed at this, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking this Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? In other words, they were Galileans. Many of them didn't speak 
some of the languages that they were hearing. These people had come from all over the province of Asia. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocius, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. They were from every nation, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own different tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, there's always one in every crowd. They've had too much wine. That's what's wrong with all these. My words added in that one. Then Peter stood up with the 11. That's the 11 disciples, not the 120 in the upper room. Don't think. He said it was 120. Now why is it 11? That's the disciples. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I am about to say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. The original language says, I will pour out my people on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved to the glory of God Almighty. Somebody give him praise in the house. The Holy Spirit is the most mysterious member of the Trinity, which includes God the Father, God the Son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit of God. Many struggle with the idea of God being three persons, yet three in one. Quite honestly, I don't know that we'll ever fully grasp the concept of this, this side of heaven. Some, however, has long been the thought of many people. Even King James had it wrong for years and years that the Holy Spirit was an it, not a him. Probably due in part to biblical descriptions of him as being like a wind or coming upon Jesus in the form of a dove. God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. When heaven opened up and a dove descended from glory and landed on the shoulder of the son of God. Among other comparisons, these descriptions must be balanced with the descriptions of the other members of the Trinity. For instance, Jesus referred himself as the bread of life or the good shepherd, just to name a couple. 
In the same way, God the Father is referred to as a refuge. Now that is a big mound of dirt and rocks and boulders and it's a safe haven, a safe place to come to. He was also, God was referred to as a consuming fire. Does this mean that Jesus is a loaf of bread or a sheep farmer or that the Father is a pile of rocks or a consuming fire, a blast furnace? By all means, of course not. These are simply metaphors that are used in Scripture to help communicate God's character to each and every one of us so that we could understand. That's why the Bible refers God as hands and feet, and, but yet the Bible tells us God is spirit. Don't say he has hands and feet. Now, we do know we have a glorified body when we get there, but we're not sure what that glorified body looks like. We just know it's absolutely amazing. Something beyond what you could articulate. Your brilliant IBM, your itty-bitty mind can't even fathom what this is going to be like. It's way beyond our pay grade, but we just know it's going to be absolutely the most awesome thing. But in the translation of God's Word, especially the book of Revelations, when God gave John the revelation, and John had to figure out the best way he could in his mind with what he was seeing and then trying to get some kind of description to it. Something that had the tail of a scorpion and the lion, uh, the head of a lion, and the, that's some wild stuff. Some said, well, that, I guess it could be a helicopter. I mean, who knows? John never saw a helicopter, didn't know what one looked like. But when he saw this weird beast, he had to put together the best thing he could to articulate the Word of God and to write it down as was described. Likewise, the unique descriptions attributed to the Holy Spirit do not imply that the Holy Spirit is merely some force or some power or some it. Jesus said this about the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you, people, into all truth. God don't do anything halfway. God's perfect, flawless. God has to be as much love as He has to be in retribution, as He has to be in judgment as he has to be in character, as he has to be in discipline. If he were not, then he would not be perfect. And listen, tough love is the hardest thing for most Christians to comprehend. But I am here to tell you today that in this world we live in today, I promise you, by what I study, what I read, what I've learned, by what I've counseled, and by what I see, most people in this country today, God has to deal with in tough love because we still want it our way. We still want to give God advice on what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And that's all right for someone else. But for me, God, uh, let me give you a couple of pointers. The Spirit, when He comes, will guide you into all truth. He will also tell you all about the future. John 16, 13, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to still come. The work which the Lord began was to be continued by the Spirit of truth. He would guide them into all truth. 
there is a sense in which all truth was committed to the apostles in their lifetime. They in turn committed it to writing. And in turn, we have it today in our Bible in the New Testament. This added to the Old Testament. God has completed God's written revelation to man himself. But it is, of course, true in all ages that the Spirit guides people in all, and I capitalize that, in all truth. He does this through Scripture. He will only speak the things that are given to him to say by the Father and by the Son. He will tell you things to come. This, of course, is done in the New Testament and particularly in the book of Revelation where the future is unveiled. Notice the use of the pronoun he, capitalize that, when speaking of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a distinct personality, and he also has specific work that he wants to do in our lives as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to explore what the Bible says about him, for a better understanding of who God the Father is, who God the Son is, and who God the Holy Spirit is. Who is the Holy Spirit? And who is the Holy Spirit here to help? I'm glad you asked. The Holy Spirit has been given to all believers to deepen their spiritual walk and to enable them to make an impact upon their world for Jesus Christ through their witness, and through their way of handling life's ups and downs. Most of the time, the world doesn't take much notice of Christians because we blend in instead of stand out. But when they notice is when we're going through stuff, and the world sees an opportunity to watch how we receive it, how we perceive it, how we handle it if we're truly walking what we're talking or if we handle it no different than the world would, then they know that we serve a very small God and that our problems to us are bigger than what we think God can handle. And the whole problem with that is, is stinking thinking. Get your mind off of the things of the flesh and out of the world and put your mind on the supernatural because there's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that God can't accomplish. And there's nothing that God can't do through you if you let him give him praise in the house. This particular passage will illustrate three aspects of the Holy Spirit's unique work in the lives of born-again, Spirit-filled believers. Number one, the Holy Spirit fills all believers. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given only to a select few. Now, I said the Old Testament, given only to a select few to perform specific tasks at specific times. This chapter indicates a change now in that pattern. The Holy Spirit was poured out on all the believers in the house that day. All 120 in the upper room experienced the power of God. Can you imagine looking around and seeing what looked like tongues of flames of fire landing on your neighbors beside you and then seeing one come down and land on you? And all of a sudden, now, almost like an out-of-body experience, you see yourself saying and doing things that you've never learned, that you don't know, that while this is going on, it's blowing you away, too, that, my God, what is going on? Look what I'm doing. This ain't me. And to a whole nation of people outside that gathered around. Are we not listening to Galileans 
speaking our own native language. Some of these people have never been. They don't know my language. But yet, how can I understand every word they're saying? Because they're speaking an unknown language. That's what tongues are. And by the way, for those of you today that might be going, well, I've, I've always heard about it in the Bible, but I've always been shy of it. People laugh at it and make fun of it. That's ignorance. That's ignorance. And we have a couple of mainstream denominations that don't believe in it. They believe that, but they're also afraid of the Holy Ghost. They'll believe in the gifts of love and the gifts of benevolence, helping someone in a time of need, but prophesying, speaking in tongues. No, when the apostles went to heaven, that went out. And listen, most of these are pastor friends of mine from this mainstream denomination. I can't tell you how many I've handed my Bible to and said, show me in that book where it says that gift went out when the apostles went to heaven. Well, I can't show you that, Brother Joe. It's not in there. So then where are you getting it at? Where are you getting it at if it ain't in there? Let me tell you where they're getting it at. And I don't say this to pick on anyone, but I'm saying this because this is one of the areas in Henry County that has been debated and argued by many fellowships. I will say some go overboard. But listen, I've seen people do gifts of God in the flesh when people will go, well, that's in the flesh. That's of the devil when they're speaking some gibberish I don't understand. I've seen people love that were Christians with the wrong motives that's in the flesh. It's a gift. But if you are a mainstream denomination that don't believe in that gift, are you going to tell people when they say, how come other ministries do it and you don't? Because we're scared of the Holy Ghost. We don't want people laughing at us because we're uh, very conservative with our religion. We don't want people laughing at us. So we can't tell you we're afraid of it. We've got to tell you that we don't believe it exists today, that when the apostles went to heaven, that gift went with them. That's why they say that, because they're not going to admit to you that people mock it, they ridicule it, and some abuse it. That's true. But it still doesn't mean it's not a gift from God. And it doesn't mean it's not a holy gift and done the proper way. And you'll find out. I want to bust a, a myth right now. The evidence, and this is where some on the Pentecostal side carry it way too far. The evidence of salvation is not, I remind you, the evidence of salvation is not speaking in tongues. There are many people that don't speak in tongues there are many that don't want to. I've had people call and say, if I come to your church, do I have to speak in tongues? You know what I tell them? No. If you want to, you can ask for it. But if you don't want to, you don't have to do it. We worship God freely. Now, I will tell you right now, half of our membership prays in tongues. Probably, maybe even a little more, the other half don't. Has that ever hindered you from coming in here and worshiping together? No, because we're not going to let it. We're not going to look down on the ones that do pray in tongues, and we're not going to look down on the ones that don't. That's between them and God. But if you want it, you can ask for it, and God will give it to you. And I'm not one of them preachers. I don't believe in this. I think it's silly. I think it's ridiculous. I'm not one of them preachers that would tell you if you want to speak in tongues, go sit down in front of a mirror and talk like a baby, goo goo gaga, -ga, and do it. And listen, I've heard preachers say this, and I've rebuked every one of them that I've heard it.
Just do it real, real fast. And eventually, God will give you the gift. God don't work through idiocracy. That's not how God works. I've seen people praise and worshiping God that God give them the spirit of tongues and then begin to pray and worship with God in tongues. You don't have to go resort to something stupid and ridiculous for God to honor his word. That, that's, that's asinine. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard some big preachers on TV even do that. And that's ridiculous. And they should be a lot farther in their walk with the Lord than I am because I've been doing this for only 30 years. But I guess God put me in three different churches when I got saved and kept me in them long enough not to be indoctrinated. He kept me in them long enough to learn the word and then move me on. Didn't know why at the time, but I do now. God had a reason. I'm inspired by tradition, but I will not let tradition hold me back. Oh, we don't, we don't do that. Now, let me go on. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. What is the significance of filling with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Listen to this. It meant the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise that was spoken of in Joel. Chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, when God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh at the end times. Since the last days of this age had begun, everyone was now confronted with the decision to repent and believe in Christ. The disciples were clothed with power on high. This enabled them to witness for Christ with great zeal and enthusiasm. Also to be people through whom the Holy Spirit could bring great conviction to the lost in relation to sin, righteousness, and God's judgment, and in turn the lost from sin to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit revealed his nature as a spirit who longs and strives for the salvation of people of every nation. Those who received the baptism in the Holy Spirit were filled with the same longing for the salvation of the human race, beginning with world missions. The disciples became ministers of the Spirit. They not only preached Jesus crucified and resurrected, which was leading others to repentance and faith in Christ, but they also influenced converts to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Can somebody, anybody, could everybody give the line of the tribe of Judah some praise in this house? Repent and be baptized. Repentance and forgiveness of sins and baptism are the prior conditions for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. However, Peter's demand that his hearers be baptized in water before receiving the promise of the Father, this must not be taken as an absolute requirement for the infilling with the Spirit. Nor is baptism in the Spirit, an automatic consequence of water baptism. You can have one without the other. You can also have one before you got the other. Depends on how God wants to do it. Now let me explain. In this situation, Peter required water baptism prior to receiving God's promise. Partly because in the minds of his Jewish listeners... The rite of baptism was taken for granted as being involved in every single conversion decision. Water baptism did not perceive the baptism in the Spirit. However, in the instances recorded in chapter 9, verse 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul in chapter 10, 
verse 44 through 48, as well as those in Cornelius' household. If you'll remember reading that in the second chapter of the book of Acts, you'll see where the Spirit fell on those in Cornelius' house, many of them in the pool. They began to speak in other languages before they received salvation. And if you'll remember, Peter said, because these were not Jews, how can we keep them from receiving salvation? God has just blessed them with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they're speaking in tongues out here. Read the book. So at that time, they led them to the Lord and salvation because they were already speaking in tongues a different language. Each believer, after repenting of his or her sin and accepting Jesus Christ by faith, must receive a personal baptism in the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit in the book of Acts was consciously desired, sought, and appropriated. The only possible exception to the rule in the New Testament was the case of Cornelius. Consequently, the baptism of the Spirit should not be considered as a gift automatically provided to the believer in Christ. When Paul said, for you and your children and for all, the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not just for those present on the day of Pentecost, but for all who would believe in Jesus Christ throughout the ages. When he said, for you, which was Peter's audience at that time he was speaking. When he said, for your children, which was for the next generation coming up. And when he said, from afar off, was for the third and subsequent generations that were to come. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who receives Salvation and regeneration, if you want it. What is so important about it? I'm glad you asked. Now I can explain why it was offered from God. Baptism in the Spirit, with its accompanying power, was not a once and for all occurrence in the church's history. It did not cease with Pentecost nor did it close out at the end of the apostolic age when they went to heaven. That's not biblical. It is the birthright of every born-again, spirit-filled Christian to seek, expect, and experience the same baptism in the Spirit that was promised and given to the New Testament saints. As he continued to be present in each of their lives from that day forward, to the glory of God the Father, to the glory of God the Son, and to the glory of God the Holy Ghost, somebody shout him out a victory yell of praise. Good God Almighty. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit was used by God to establish his church and to spread the message of the gospel to the entire world. Now, can you praise him like you mean business? Number two, the Holy Spirit draws attention to the Savior. Notice that Peter did not focus on this unique happening that had just taken place, which was absolutely spectacular. But Peter stood up and said, let me explain what's taking place. Peter turned the crowd's attention to the message of Jesus Christ and their need to repent. Likewise, the Holy Spirit does not draw attention to himself, but to the Savior. And when he fills your life, he radically increases your ability, power to share the gospel with others. Give praise to the Lamb of God, somebody. 
Number three, the last one this morning, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter's message. Peter's sermon inspired by the Holy Spirit led many in the crowd to a point of decision that day. What should we do? Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? The people were not attracted to Peter, but to the message that Peter was giving. As stated in point two above, one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to draw people to God. As stated above, the Holy Spirit worked powerfully that day, and 3,000 people responded to the gospel message and gave their life to Jesus Christ, and they were saved to the glory of God. Can you give him praise in the church house? <clears throat> The Holy Spirit is promised to all who repent and receive Jesus Christ into their lives as Lord and Savior. Many people fail to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what dimension of power is available to them through the Holy Spirit. It may help to examine what took place after the disciples received the filling of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, But you, now this is after salvation, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, for what reason? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God Almighty, have you received this power? Give the Son of God praise in the house for the Holy Ghost. You will receive power. This is the key verse in the entire book of Acts. The primary purpose of the baptism in the Spirit is the receiving of power to witness for Jesus Christ so that the lost will be won over and people will be taught to obey all that Jesus Christ has commanded. First, they must receive this power. Why do you think right now among the Christian community, most Christians don't witness? Think about it. Anywhere. Why do you think most don't witness? They don't have power. They're intimidated. They're nervous. They're afraid they'll say something wrong. Or the big one, I'm just shy. I'm not that person. Nowhere in the Bible do you see God putting up with any excuse not to witness. What you do see in the Bible is God telling you that if you don't witness, if you don't share the Bible, I will hinder every prayer that you offer me. And I'll answer some and the most I won't. Pastor, that's in the Bible? Yeah. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit. Listen to what he's saying. Fruit, yes, fruit that will last. If you read and study the Bible, you'll find out that is souls because that's the only thing that lasts when everything else passes away. You'll be raised to eternal life or you'll be raised to eternal damnation but you'll live one or the other, either heaven or hell for all eternity. That's the one thing that lasts is your soul. So here's what he goes on to say. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. That's your prayer life. So what happens if you don't witness? God don't give you everything you ask for. That's exactly what it means. And it may hinder you from actually being in heaven. I don't know. I'm not God. I can just tell you that God takes a tremendous dislike for people that will not share his son to a lost, broken, and suffering world. I mean, after all, how did you get here? I went 37 years and never one time had somebody ever mentioned to me about Jesus. 
37 years, and then because I had a guy, two guys, but one of them that was faithful a couple of times, every single week at 37 years old, that started coming into my gun shop and talking to me about Jesus until I didn't want to hear no more. A guy by the name of Timber Cutter, Ray Russian, and I'd say, I've done hurt all I want to hear. I don't want to hear no more. And he'd leave. Joe, I love you, brother. I'll be back to see you. And I would think, a grown man telling another man he loves him. What's up with that stuff? Back then, I could only see perversion, you know, fruits. Not the good kind of fruit. Thinking, man, men don't tell men they love them. So he'd come back. And then finally, the one day he said it, after about two months of witnessing to be giving me little bits and pieces along the way, he was smart enough to know how to minister to me. And he said, Joe, are you saved? And I said, brother, saved from what? And he explained it to me. That day forward, I started going to church with my wife and kids, and I was a horrible person. And when I would see the smiles on my wife and kids' face sitting there on that church row, I, I knew there was a higher power. I just didn't care what it was. I was having too much fun in my life. But I made a deal with him. You know, I put this family through hell, and they really seem to enjoy this. I can come here on Sundays for a while. Seem like you're enjoying it and having peace. I'll do it. I, I can do it. I'm, I'm a man. I can do it. I went there every Sunday. Then I started going every Wednesday, and then every Wednesday and every Sunday for two months until God got a hold of me, and uh, I ran into a brick wall, and his name was Jesus, and it radically turned my life upside down. And that was third, October the 7th, 1994, and I have never been the same since. And I have... <clears throat> And God knew when he got a hold of me, he was going to have to do it all at once. He ripped the filth out of my mind. He ripped the filth out of my mouth. I mean, everything overnight gone. And you've heard me share the story. I, for the next few weeks, I went around to all my bad places. Many, I took my wife that wasn't that bad, and I told him, listen, I've met Jesus Christ, and I won't be back. I love all of you. I'll pray for you. But my life has been, I burnt every bridge I had. Because I knew if I ever turned and went back, I'd be a hypocrite, and I wasn't about to do that. I burned every bridge I had, so I had no choice but to go up. And the ones I couldn't take my wife, I didn't take her. I went in there and told her. Many respected me because of who I was. Many laughed, and many told me, said, ah, you'll be back, brother. We'll, we'll have this saved for you. You'll be back. I look at my past long enough like a rearview mirror to know where I came from and to praise God where I'm going. <clears throat> this is power from the Holy Spirit. This power is the grand, indispensable power of every Christian, born again, spirit-filled, who will witness for God no matter what. A man may be highly talented, intensely trained, and widely experienced, but without spiritual power, he is ineffective. Look how many talk about the Lord and love the Lord and don't witness. You know why? They're ineffective. They have no power. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. On the other hand, a man may be uneducated. That was me. Unattractive. That's not me unrefined, that was me. And yet him be endued with power from the Holy Ghost and the world will turn out to see him burn for Jesus Christ. The fearful disciples needed power for witnessing, holy boldness for preaching the gospel. They would receive this power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. That was the promise of God. Go into Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the promise of my Father, the Lord said. And when the Holy Ghost comes on you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. 
in all Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the world. They would receive this power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Their witness was to begin in Jerusalem, a meaningful prearrangement of the grace of God because that was the very city where they crucified the Lord. And now they're the first ones being called to repentance and having faith in him who they crucified and killed. Then Judea, the southern part of Palestine, with a strong Jewish population, and with Jerusalem as its chief city. Then Samaria, the region in the center of Palestine, with its hatred, half-breed population, with whom Jews had no dealings with. Then the end of the then-known world, the Gentile countries, which had been outside the pale as far as religious privileges was concerned. In this ever-widening circle of witness, we have a general outline of the flow of history in the book of Acts, and I'll be finished here in about three minutes. Number one, the witness in Jerusalem was chapters one through seven of Acts. Number two, the witness in Judea and Samaria were chapters eight, verse one through nine, verse 31 of the book of Acts. And number three, the witness to the end of the earth were chapters 9, verse 32, through chapters 28, verse 31 of the book of Acts. The word power, the Greek word, is dunamis. It means more than strength or ability. It designates especially power in operation, in action, faith applied. Luke in his gospel and in Acts emphasizes that the Holy Spirit's power included the authority to drive out evil spirits and the anointing to heal the sick as to be the two essential signs accompanying the proclamation of God's kingdom. The release of this power of the Holy Ghost in Acts in and through the believers' lives caused them to witness with magnificent boldness, with great power, with intensity, enthusiasm, to testify and many signs, wonders, and miracles with great results for the kingdom of heaven. Luke here does not relate the baptism in the Spirit to personal salvation and regeneration. This baptism is the power within the believer's life to witness beyond measure with great boldness and great effectiveness to the glory of God the Father. Somebody give him praise in the house. The release of the power of the Holy Spirit impacts in and through the believer's lives. The Holy Spirit's principal work in witnessing and proclamation concerns its coming upon believers for power and his testimony to Christ's saving work and resurrection. <coughs> <coughs> A true witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ are Christian witnesses who confirm and testify to the saving work of Jesus Christ by word, deed, life, and if necessary, even unto death. Are you this kind of a Christian witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? Give the God one last praise offering of hallelujah in this place. Every eye closed, every head bowed. John 3, 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Heaven is your new home, and it's waiting for you. Your new home is given to you when you accept the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross for your sins to give you eternal life. When you repent of your sins and make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, heaven will be yours forevermore. If this is for you and you would like to do that today, then you just simply pray after me. You can do it out loud or you can do it under your breath. But if you want to receive Jesus Christ today, 
It won't make everything smooth in your life, but it'll give you a helper that promised to never leave you nor forsake you. God will help you every step of the way, and he'll help you walk the talk and talk the walk. And if you decide to choose this as your church home, we'll hook up beside you and help you walk this thing out every single day. All you got to do is just keep coming. I will commit my life to preaching and teaching the whole word of God to you, the whole counsel of God. And you can take it from there and study on your own and you won't recognize who you are in Christ three months, six months from now. Just repeat after me if this is for you. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent of everything I have ever done wrong in my life. I accept your sacrifice for me at the cross. I open up my heart and my life right now, Lord, and I invite you to come in. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. I make you my Lord because now you are my Savior. You are my boss and I am not. Help me to live every day to receive your word to read the Bible, and to be a better Christian today than I was yesterday. And if this just happened for me today, help me, Lord, to be a better Christian tomorrow than I am today. But help me to try every single day. I make you my Lord, my Savior right now, and I receive heaven as my brand new home. In Jesus' name, with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you prayed that prayer today, would you simply raise your hand right where you sit? Let me know that you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. I see the hand, my brother. God bless you. I see the hand. Anybody else? How awesome it is to see one repositioned from the pit of hell now go into glory. That God is now his father. Jesus is now his Lord and Savior and he is well on his way to heaven. Praise God. Praise God. As Brother Darren 